Good morning. Thank you very much for those kind words in the introduction. Uh, I, let me get right out in front and say that I think experience is going to be the most overused or the most used word today. Um, I think Rich set the tone um, with that about FedEx, uh, a great brand uh, that does provide tremendous experiences for their consumers. Um, so I'm very excited to be here today, very honored that I was asked to come and speak to you today. Um, before I get into uh, the five new truths for brands in the digital age, I'm going to start with a bit of a premise and set that up. Um, and give you a bit of a lens, if you will, to sort of e to experience this presentation through. Um, there is no doubt that we are living through a revolution. The digital and technological revolutions have changed the way that brands communicate and connect and engage with their consumers. It's also a more complex and more creative space than it's ever been before, and frankly, it's quite intimidating. I think for people like myself who spend all our days in the agency thinking about ways to apply the new technologies to our brand, to our clients' brands, we are constantly bombarded with the latest and the greatest. It's a, it's a very difficult thing to sort through. It's impossible to predict what's coming next. But in this sea change that we're experiencing, there is a series of new truths that I believe have emerged. And starting off, the reality is when you look at traditional advertising and marketing, it's long since been an industry dominated by words, dominated by slogans, dominated by taglines and campaigns, things that were really brands talking and shouting at you, at the consumer, in an effort to try to get you to take notice of them, and then of course to take some action against them. Things have changed. These, all of these types of methods have applied the, the, the principle of interruption to succeed. Think about television and radio, print. All of these are intrusive forms of advertising and marketing. And they're all based, again, on the communication and on the message, and not so much on the experience. And how do they do this? They do this by engaging the audience via attitude and character. Right? You may recognize the most interesting man in the world. It's a Dos Equis campaign that's running now. It's become hugely successful. Right? There's some parallels, obviously, given that it's an alcohol brand to these folks in this room here. Um, we've gotten interested in this person. There's a character being developed here, a story, a backstory. Um, this is a perfect example of traditional advertising. And with that comes making claims and, again, telling that story. And it's all supported by shouting from the top of the mountaintop. One-way mass communication hoping a sliver of your target audience hears it, takes some action against it. Obviously, if you're really lucky, the advertising in this case becomes memorable, becomes a part of pop culture. This is rare, and it's extremely expensive. And the great news is, is that while those are very interesting backdrops to have in marketing, and they're always going to be there, it's, an, it, it's a difficult thing to achieve. And I think for the small and the medium-sized businesses that are here today, the reality is that marketing and advertising is becoming more democratic. We're able to enlist some of these types of methods, some of these types of devices that were, no, were not always available to, to smaller businesses. And here's what's happening today. We have a more intelligent and a more informed consumer. And that, combined with technology, is creating an ever-changing and complex landscape for brands. There's just no question about this. The stakes are higher now. And we're in the midst of a sea change. We're in the midst of a massive and pervasive shift in the way that brands engage and connect and talk with their consumers. It's not so much, again, about just shouting at them about that one-way mass communication. It's about having a dialogue. It's about giving them utilities. It's about giving them added value, surrounding the entire experience with things that are beyond just the product or just the service that you buy. And in a lot of ways, these brands are trying to construct very human relationships, right? Why do we, why, what drives us as humans are the interactions and the relationships we have with one another. And this is what brands are trying to do. So my argument is that the brand experience, all of it, again, not just the product and not just the service, is what is fueling today's most successful brands. It's about the entire branded experience. And here's a couple of really interesting examples. Brands can offer a free service almost as easily as it can now offer a marketing message. One, a few of my favorite applications here. One is this North Face Trailhead application. It's for iPhone and Android, all of the mobile devices. And what is it? It's a wayfinder for finding 
interesting things to do outdoors. Finding a trail. It connects to the GPS in your phone, so it finds you different outdoor activities. North Face recognizes that not everyone who downloads this free application and uses it is outfitted head to toe in North Face gear, although I'm sure they wish that was the case. Right? But what they do understand is that for those that do buy their gear, this is an added value. It's free, and it gives those folks who love to be in the outdoors a way to easily find those things, whether you're close to home or far away from home. It's a great example of that sort of utility. Charmin's sit or squat application, kind of a funny name um, for those of us who have young children and perhaps travel around, uh, we always know that finding a bathroom can be, can be a difficult chore. Well, Charmin developed this application which allows you to find a bathroom anywhere in the, in the country. There's ratings. There's ratings for these bathrooms. We've all gone into those horrible bathrooms in a, in a gas station when we had to go and just wished, oh my God, wish there was something better I could find. Well, with this application, there's a chance that you'd have a, have a shot at, at finding something a little bit more uh, suitable for your needs. Um, and again, Charmin's not in the bathrooms you're going to, right? They recognize that they're, that's just not their core business, but their core business, as unsexy as it might be, is toilet paper. And so they recognize that if they provide that free service, if they provide that extra little thing that's helped me save my three and a half year old from having a miserable experience on the side of the road somewhere, that as I walk down the aisle on Safeway and I see the Charmin brand, perhaps I'll give it a little bit more consideration. Perhaps I'll have a little bit more affinity for that brand. Similarly, Stanley's Level, one of my favorites, I've hung pictures with this. You know, um, I tinker around my house, a little bit of a home improvement junkie. You know, so while I'm not a diehard Stanley branded consumer, the reality is once again, like Charmin's Sitter Squat application, it's given me an extra little piece of value. And again, Stanley is, is smart enough to understand that not everybody who downloads this app is suddenly going to be buying Stanley tools everywhere. It's an added value for those that are already buying it. It creates uh, an ambient relationship for those who might be interested or might have a propensity to potentially buy tools and then might give Stanley more consideration as a result of it. So these are the kinds of things, these free or low cost tools, applications, games and utilities that add real value. Not just talking about the value they add, not just telling you how wonderful and great they are or telling you about the next promotion. This is tangible value. I want to make one quick point because I don't want to be misunderstood. Communication is always going to be very critical to marketing and advertising. The projection of our voice as brands, the offers we have, the products we sell, the services we're marketing, all very, very critical. And I don't want to discount that. Communication can be powerful, it can be very, very persuasive, and again, it's always going to be an ingredient to what it is we're doing. But over time, and in the last five years in particular, as technology continues to accelerate at the pace that it is, the reality is, Communication is becoming a little less important. Its role is becoming a little less effective. So as you look to the future, my hypothesis is that successful marketing strategy of the future will be based on behavioral engagement. It's less about demographics. It's less about knowing where they live. It's really about what your consumers do, right? Understanding what their actual behavior is. Functional utilities. The three examples I just gave you are perfect illustrations of this. Interactivity and interaction. Again, kind of recognizing that humans want to interact. And so giving them tools and giving them applications that allow them to have interaction, whether it be between them and the brand or them and other consumers, is going to be driving marketing strategies of the future. And finally, entertainment, play, and gamification. And this is sort of happening everywhere. The idea of you know, brands putting out games. Uh, automobile manufacturers producing free little uh, driving games, for example, on your, on your phone. Again, does it, how, how much or how little does it impact sales? I think the jury's still out on that, and I think we, we don't really know the answer to that question yet. But at the same time, it's again creating that ambient, that sort of extended relationship with you and, giving, and, and hoping that they're planting a seed for future consideration of that brand. And what's it going to result in? It's going to result in multi-platform interactive experiences. These are, these are experiences that will spawn different devices, whether it's your iPad to your iPhone. They'll be, you can pick up one thing, pick it up on another thing. It will solve informational, functional, and aspirational goals. It's, again, it's not just going to be about come buy me, come try me. It's going to be about helping you 
hopefully have a better existence with the, acti the activities that you're already doing. Excuse me. And experiences that unite analog, digital, and physical environments. And this is something I think is very, very exciting. It really applies to the folks in this room and the industry that you work in every day. Um, Rich said it really well, you know, that, that wine is an experience. And there's a lot of layers to that experience. You know, it's, it's, it's social in nature. Um, it can be an ingredient to an amazing experience or it can be the experience on its own. Um, there's the before and all of the work that goes into it. There's the middle of enjoying it. And frankly, there's the aftermath of it. I collect corks. You know, I love writing on my corks and saying, hey, this is my fourth anniversary with my wife or, you know, uh, this was a birthday dinner. So there's interesting ways in which this really applies to you. And so simply stated, I believe we're in the eye of the experience economy. So let me jump into the five new truths. Truth number one, experiences are more important than, than marketing and advertising messages for brands in the digital age. It's not a new idea. Back in 1920, Michelin released their now famous Michelin Guide. I'm sure many of you, if not all of you, are familiar with this. And what was the purpose of this guide? The purpose of the guide was to get people into their cars, driving to check out restaurants or hotels. And what, was the, and what did Michelin see as the value here? They took the long view. They recognized that the more people they put into their cars and the more people drove their cars, the more rubber on their tires they would burn. And so you had this very interesting relationship happening. Michelin was providing a free service, a service that became extremely reputable, extremely valuable to become a part of that, that publication. And it got people in their cars driving more, which in turn allowed Michelin to sell more vehicles. The reality is, I think several of you are already doing this today. Through my research and conversations that I've had with a number of folks, um, I know that, for example, Raymond Vineyards has created a series of exclusive experiences, whether it be through their Red Room, um, whether it be through private tasting seminars. You already know about this, and so I would encourage you to continue to think about how you add additional experiences around just the mere product of wine. And as this continues to happen, the lines between marketing and products and services will continue to blur. Let's look at a few powerful examples of experience-centric brands. By a show of hands, do, how many people here know what Nike Plus is? So, not that many. Um, Nike Plus uh, exists to create master runners. And it's a brainchild between Nike and Apple. Um, it's a website, but it's more than that. It's a full-on product, community. It allows you to track your runs. It allows you to compete against others. It allows you to get training tips based on my actual performance, not generic performance tips. And so Nike focused and Apple focused on, on the outcomes, not necessarily the output. So I ask you the question, is this a product or a service? or a, mark, a marketing device, or a community? And my answer is, it's yes, 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 and yes. And that's what makes it so brilliant, that it's, it's seamless, and it's integrated, and there's a certain amount of subtlety to it, but it's adding tremendous value to those who make running a part of their everyday lives. And it naturally benefits from the network effect on several levels. As, as I said, it's already a community. It's easy for me to invite others. It's easy, easy for me to, to, to uh, challenge someone across the country to a 5K run. I can set my own goals. Um, the idea is that it's, the consumers themselves are bringing people into the brand. And there's nothing more powerful than having a consumer advocate on behalf of you and turning you into free media on behalf of that brand. And that's exactly what Nike Plus has done. And it's about recognizing the role that the brand can play in making their existing activities better. And this is a perfect example of that. Nike and Apple recognized, recognized that there was a void in the marketplace. A void, there was no community, an online community for runners. And so what they did is they built this relatively organic community of like-minded competitive athletes where they share and track and compete against one another. And so in this context, 
Nike and Apple understood what your consumers do. It didn't matter if you were male or female. It didn't matter if you were age 24 to 38. You know, the demographics didn't matter. It was about psychographics. It was about understanding that runners themselves are naturally competitive. And here was, again, this all-inclusive device product that would, that would facilitate this, this behavior. And it creates a meaningful connection between the brand and the consumers. And this is what happens when you offer additional value wrapped in a thoughtful, and I would argue the most important part, a relevant experience. It's got to be relevant. Without relevancy, you have nothing. And so in turn, it's created all these organic consumers and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars for both Apple and Nike as a direct result of this product. And like the last piece to a puzzle, the perfect marketing experience seamlessly complements and enhances the physical relationship with the products themselves. This is an absolutely perfect example of that. A former colleague of mine from Razorfish, Joe Crump, I think sums it up very nicely. A perfect experience markets itself. Let's look at another example. I'm sure many of you in here are Starbucks, Starbucks consumers. And they've recently introduced a mobile card. You may be familiar with their physical card, the ones that they have at the counter. You buy them, you put a certain amount of money on them, they sort of act as a debit card. Well, Starbucks has turned that into a mobile application. I have it on my iPhone. It's available for Android as well. And just to be clear on what it does, it replaces this debit card. It tracks my orders. I can refill the card over the air. I don't have to either, ever have to have that, that, uh, that exchange at the counter where I've got to then not only order my coffee and add more money to it. And so what have they done here? They're also rewarding me. It's keeping track of my purchases so it knows that once I get to a certain number, I'm going to get a series of rewards. This type of rewarding me for my loyalty has become really, really critical for brands. And most importantly, you can use it spontaneously. I can't tell you how many times I always left that, that Starbucks card. It never seemed to make it into my wallet. So when I got to the counter and I was there ready to pay, hmm, I didn't have it. Well, we all know that chances are you're going to have your phone with you. And so like Nike Plus, there's a free value in here, and this is in the form of convenience. In exchange for that convenience, Starbucks builds a more intimate relationship, a more knowledgeable relationship with you as the consumer. And ultimately, it leads to more revenue. And so again, I pose the question, is this a marketing, is this product, a service, or an integrated experience that drives more revenue? And my answer is yes, again, to all four of those. We're all huge fans of Apple in the room, I'm sure. Um, and I think there's some really, really powerful examples here between your industry and Apple, believe it or not. The Genius Bar, it's mostly a free service, consulting service that offers training and advice. And then what happens is, is they bring a lot of folks into the Genius Bar. And in turn, people buy more Apple products. But are they buying more Apple products because they're sitting across from somebody who's more knowledgeable of them and is, and is giving them uh, a sales pitch about what products they should be buying? I would argue that that's, very, that's, that's not a very big part of the offering. That they're teaching them how to use the technology. And that because they're teaching them how to use the technology and because there's more knowledge about that, people are more interested in buying more technology. Because the better you know how to use it, the more likely you are to go back and get more of it. And I think Apple clued into this very, very early on. And I think this is a great parallel. I'm a, very, I'm a novice when it comes to wine. I'll raise my hand and say that very much. But I admire and have sort of a, a little bit of a, you know, a jealousy in me when, I, when I, I look across the room here and I know how much knowledge there is about wine. So my argument would be that the more knowledge people have about wine, the more they understand why they like a particular brand of wine or why they like a particular vintage. This is the way you will encourage people to buy more of your products. Another obvious sort of parallel for your industry is Whole Foods and their recipe application. There's a lot of different recipe applications out there now. And again, similar to the North Face example or the Stanley example, Whole Foods is providing a very cool little recipe application. They know that you're not buying all of these ingredients necessarily from Whole Foods, but again, what they recognize is, is that they create additional value for those that are, an ambient relationship for those that might consider Whole Foods as a brand. IKEA, borrowing from product placement 
strategies of the past. They've, they've constructed complete hotel experiences outfitted head to toe in IKEA products. It allows consumers to experience these pro products in situation. And again, people may or may not in turn decide to go buy the IKEA product, but the exposure that that gives them and the exposure that the brand gets as a result creates a very, very cool and in context experience. And so when it works, it turns buyers into subscribers, and that's a very, very key word, because one-off sales doesn't help you very much. What you want are people coming back. What you want are creating ties between you and the consumer so that there's a relationship there that you can build on. It creates more revenue, fandom, and ultimately loyalty. So as I conclude this first truth, and as you consider how to weave experience marketing into your strategies, whether it's complex and involved, like Nike Plus, or whether it's a simple utility, something like the Charmin, sit, and, sit or squat, or the Stanley Level application. Consider the overall experience. Consider more about what you're giving as a tangible value, as opposed to the words that you're using. Because these experiences are smarter, they're more relevant, and I would argue much more subtle, which allow you to create very direct, but also importantly, those ambient relationships between you and your consumers. But remember that experience-driven marketing is only effective when it's really focused on the experience. So it can't be disingenuous. Those of us that have flown Virgin America maybe can appreciate this. You know, they really, from the ground up, marketing into the experience, experience into the marketing, and it really works. They've woven technology throughout the entire cabin, and they sort of continue to look at ways to, to improve that experience. Because at the end, if it's not genuine, if it's not authentic, again, if it's not relevant, it will fail. Don't create marketing-based experiences for the sake of it. Understand what's relevant and what's important for your brand as you move forward on this. The second truth is authenticity is now a requirement. And as I talk about and talk through this section, I would encourage you to think about what does authenticity mean to you, both individually and for the companies you work for? What does it mean for your brand? And how do you express this authenticity? And is your authenticity a part of your marketing? And why is authenticity so important? Well, it's important because 84% of consumers don't trust marketing, and I actually think that figure has to be low. I mean, it <laughs> seems to me that 16% of the people are, are believing what we're saying when it comes to marketing, I find that hard to believe. Marketing is becoming less about image and is more about reality. We have moved into an age where we are doing or should be doing and not saying. And what does this mean? This means that companies must behave the way they claim they're behaving or risk damaging their brands. You'll be humiliated by the speed of the internet information will get out, and it will kill your brand. Specifically, socially responsible brands are greatly benefiting from this new truth. And they're weaving their altruistic behavior right into the brand experience, right into the marketing. In this context, it appears to be genuine and authentic and admirable. And it is all of those things. Because what they're doing is they're creating human and approachable relationships. Again, I ask you to think about your, your own personal relationships. I ask you to think about how you hire people. You hire people you like. You buy from brands you like. So let's look at a few examples of authenticity really coming through in the marketing. Tom's Shoes, maybe at the top of the food chain when it comes to this, has executed this strategy to perfection. Consider the power of their promise to give a new pair of shoes to a child in need every time they sell a pair of shoes. So unless you hate children, <laughs> I wish it was my kid, it's not. You know, this promise likely appeals to most consumers. It'd, it'd be hard not to feel good about supporting a brand that's giving away a pair of shoes for every pair of shoes they sell to children in need. But I want to make it clear that corporate social responsibility is not a requirement to be an authentic brand. Authenticity can be whatever it means to you. I believe it's admirable, it's a great business model, but it isn't a requirement. 
Foot Locker's Sneakerpedia. Believe it or not, there is an entire website called Sneakerpedia developed and managed by Foot Locker, which allows sneakerheads, those of us who collect hundreds, I would say even thousands of shoes, to put them up on display. You can vote on them. You can comment on them. You can guess what era they came from. It's really crazy, right? But the reality is, Foot Locker knows that this is their core audience. And they know that the younger generation is interested in displaying this kind of stuff about who they are and about themselves. And it's not a direct, sell to, a direct play to sell more shoes. There's absolutely no commerce whatsoever related to this. It's just a place to go, a destination to share. Seventh generation is another really interesting example of authentic marketing. They, they have a complete list of all their ingredients, which is not common in the cleaning space or the cleaning product space. It's a clear, honest, and consistent message about their mission to create effective cleaning products that don't harm the people or the environment. A couple years back, you may remember that Domino's had a very unfortunate incident where a, YouTube, uh, a video made it onto YouTube with some of their cooks and chefs doing some rather unfortunate things to their food. And this was a wake-up call for Domino's on a couple of different levels. They addressed this with a pretty aggressive PR campaign. They came out and owned it and said that they were going to put all sorts of programs into place to ensure that this didn't happen. But what it did is it opened up the floodgates for them and it really put them in an interesting position to have a in springboard to have a conversation, an honest conversation with their, with their customers. I want to play you a short two-minute video that sort of summarizes this. There comes a time when you know you've got to make a change. You know, you can't lead a, a, a company like this unless you love food. I love food. I love pizza. Pizza, where's the love? <laughs> How hard? Bread, sauce, cheese, fresh ingredients. Doesn't feel like there's much love in Domino's pizza. Domino's pizza crust to me is like cardboard. Is this hard to watch? Yeah. yeah, it's hard to watch. I hear what some folks are saying about our stuff. Oh, this one's bad. Worst excuse for pizza I've ever had. The sauce tastes like ketchup. Totally void of flavor. You know what? When you first hear it, it's, it's, it's shocking. The cardboard complaint is the most common one. This we hear over and over and over. I mean, that hits you right in the heart. This is what we've done. This is what I've done, you know, for 25 years now. You can either use negative comments to get you down, or you can use them to excite you and energize your process of making a better pizza. We did the latter. Most companies uh, hide the criticism that they're, they're getting, and we actually faced it head on. Some people didn't get us credit for the, the taste of our product. That's what we're fixing. We listen to our consumers, and they want us to be better, and we want them to be happier. We want people to love our pizza. This is what's driving us. This is what's lit the fire under us. This is what's making us want to get better. Who are we? Pizza! It's been crazy down here. We had our best chefs working hard to find the best combination, looking at 10 cross types, 15 sauces, dozens of cheeses. Started working on the cheese. We've got shredded cheese. It's tastier. When you smell it, it's got an aroma to it. I mean, this is what cheese should be. We started working on the sauce. New sauce is bright, it's spicy, it's robust. Started working on the crust. A nice, rich, buttery crust. I can't wait to have people try it. And it's not even about being right, it's about us having great food. No, it's about us being right. <laughs> so make no mistake about it, that's obviously an advertisement, and it was constructed by their ad agency. But I think what's more important is to look at the vulnerability that Domino's displayed in doing this. I mean, it's, it's a risky proposition to go out and say, hey, the consumers are saying our food doesn't taste very good. It's, that's what their business is. And yeah, you can make an argument that Domino's is about convenience, it's about low cost, but at the end of the day, anybody that's serving food wants it to taste good. And let me just read this quote really quickly, which is from their CEO. Our strategy tapped into a consumer insight that had nothing to do with pizza. 
At the time we were doing the brand positioning, all these banks were going under and folks were asking for bailouts and the bailouts created by the politicians and funded by the middle class. Consumers were just looking for people to stop lying to them, stop ripping them off, and just to be truthful and transparent. That was a societal finding, not specifically related to pizza, obviously. So that vulnerability lets you identify with them and it's been hugely successful with them. And what it is, is it becomes, you become more human as a result of it, right? Because the more human you are, the more real you are, the more likely consumers are to adopt and very importantly promote your brand. I mean, how many brands have people tattooing them on their body? Zappos is a really very, very cool uh, example of this as well. And they've taken their core values and built that right into their marketing and right into the products and services. They don't spend a lot of money on advertising. They don't spend a lot of money on marketing. But what they do is they provide value in the form of free shipping, backwards and forwards. They have hassle-free returns. They invest in, in relatively high-paid customer service representatives, which is, a, is a, just an enormously important thing in their business. Um, and they've earned legions of followers as a result. Consumers talk about Zappos as if it were a person, and that's a very good thing. And what's interesting is Zappos doesn't think it's in the shoe business, although that's about 90% of what they sell. Tony Shea, their CEO, believes he's in the business of delivering happiness. That's a pretty powerful statement. I think you guys could probably identify with that. Wine, again, experience delivering happiness. There's something very joyful about the products that you sell. We all remember maybe five years ago, Dove's Real Beauty campaign, and that was globally recognized, a lot of reverence for the brand, because it was a more honest portrayal of women and beauty, and what did beauty mean for us, and it spawned a lot of really interesting conversations. And so, the lessons to be learned is that authentic brands reflect strong and defined cultures, and when you smartly blend that into the marketing, you create more genuine consumer experiences, you create more connection between you and your consumers, and ultimately drive more loyalty. So in closing this, I would say don't talk about, be authentic, about being authentic, be authentic, but have that conversation with yourself and with your colleagues about what does that authenticity mean and then how do you integrate that into your business. People will appreciate it, consumers will reward you for it. Let's jump into truth number three. The power and influence of social media is real. And I just say quickly, I know there's a lot of folks in this room that have a lot of knowledge about this space. Um, my hope here today is just to punctuate a little bit about what you already know and give you a few additional examples. David Jones is the global CEO of Havas and Euro RSCG, which is a big advertising agency holding company, I think says something very powerful. We're living through the social revolution, which is every bit as significant as the industrial revolution. And clearly none of us were around for the industrial revolution, but I would argue that there's a lot of truth to that. Things have changed wildly, and the way that we're communicating, the way that consumers are now communicating between each other is, is really, really powerful. Because people do what they do because of other people, right? I mean, think about this. We're all, I would bet, all of us in this room are old enough to remember the pre-internet age. How did you find out about the, great, the, 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 the restaurant that you were gonna go to next, or the movie? You talk to your friends about it. People would make those recommendations. Because it's always been about word of mouth. It's always been about an endorsement. It's the oldest form of marketing that exists in the world and arguably the most effective. It's not a new concept. But the power of influencers is not new, but having tools available to instantly convey personal opinions is a revolution. As the number of choices expand, our dependence on curators increases proportionally and that's a really important piece. Steve Addis is another agency guy. Because right now we're generating, and I bet since I typed this on the screen, this is even more, 500 billion pure influence impressions annually via social media. And many of these, of course, are not all that important or relevant, but there is an enormous amount of information to wade through. And what's happening is this is becoming a new so sort of social truth. We've, some of you may be familiar with wisdoms of crowds. The idea that you get a collection of people together and the more people that tend to like something is going to be the way that you are likely going to feel about it. Not always, but it's a shorthand for making decisions. So people are, are taking action or not based on these. It's a really impressive and powerful statistic that 78% trust recommendations of other consumers, again, while only 14% trust advertising and marketing claims. The big number to pay attention to though is 78%. 
You know, we, you don't know me and I don't know you in this room, but the reality is, is that strangers are trusting 78% of what a stranger will tell you about something. Why? Because they sort of, they believe that you're similar to them, you're a consumer who's gone through a decision-making process, you've had an experience, and now you're going to share that. That's powerful. And Starbucks has been doing this for a long time. They've been having meaningful one-to-one -one connections and dialogues uh, with their consumers for quite a while. One of their more successful programs was MyStarbucksIdea.com. You may be familiar with this. Collecting ideas from their community, from their customers. They put them, in, they put them up on the website. They vote on them. And they allocate a certain amount of budget to implement a certain percentage of them. What better way to demonstrate to your consumer that you care about what they want, that you want to make their experiences better by taking their ideas and actually putting them into their stores themselves. Dell's Idea Storm is almost an identical program. I want my computer to weigh X number of pounds. I want it to have a certain amount of processing power. I wish it had dual screens, whatever it may be. It's been a very well received business program, marketing program for Dell. It's led to additional new product development and a considerable amount of revenue. Ford is another really interesting example. They've actually woven social technology right into their products, right into their cars, so you can talk to text, voice recognition. Um, they've even launched cars entirely on social media. And the reason I think that that's an important statement for this particular audience is, is that if Ford, who's one of the top five advertisers in the, in the world, spending hundreds upon hundreds of millions of dollars, they've now result, resorted to using social media as one of their primary devices, this should be encouraging for smaller and medium-sized businesses. Because the reality is the social web rewards difference, especially when that difference is better. And as you think about social marketing, keep something in mind, that active listening is just as important, if not more important, than amplifying your message or communicating your experience to a broader group of people. Because if you listen and you pay attention, the social intelligence that you'll glean will always trump demographic information. It always will. Because the consumer is telling you exactly what they like and what they don't like. <clears throat> and so as you think about social media, create communi communities. And not necessarily marketplaces. It can't always be a direct sell. A direct, uh, excuse me, a direct play to sell. Or a promotion to buy. Because what's the most important word on the internet? Anybody want to yell it out? Oh, come on. Share. Because again, you turn your consumers into free media. They go off and talk about it. I had this great experience at this winery. I had the most amazing bottle of wine. This is what you want. You want to turn all of us into little walking media talking about your brand. I think this quote perfectly sums it up. Sharing is the driver. Sharing is in our DNA. It's something that we do as humans. So how do we tap into it and make it work on behalf of your brand? The fourth truth for brands in the digital age is that mass customization comes of age. Chris Anderson, author of The Long Tail, says, increasingly mass marketing is turning into a mass of niches. I think that's really true, and technology is fueling this. Mass production and a one-size-fits-all mentality has now given way to individual customization, personalization, and really most interesting, co-creation. When you think about this, it's affecting our, our daily lives in some really cool and unexpected ways. You can tailor your news exactly how you want it. Those of us that have iPads in the room may be familiar with Flipboard customizable magazine. iGoogle has been doing this for five, six, maybe seven years now, where you can decide exactly what kind of news you want. You can move everything around on the page. One of my favorite newest applications is Zite, which is similar to Flipboard, personalized newspaper. It gives me just the information I want, no more, no less. Perhaps my favorite experience of all time on the web is Nike ID. I'm not a creative person necessarily. I'm around a, a lot of creative folks. I love sneakers and I love shoes. And I like to believe that I know how to create something kind of cool. Nike ID allows me to start with a basic shoe 
and add colors and style and design. Even my name can be stitched on the back of this and all for about a hundred bucks. And three weeks later, that shoe comes to me. No one else in the world has that shoe, most likely. There's something very powerful about that. And not, not to mention, it's become a hundred million dollar business for Nike. And you can customize your music in social and very personal ways. Pandora, again, one of my favorite, favorite brands. Almost 100 million users, 94 million users at last count. I had the good fortune of working on the mini brand for three and a half years. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but there is a configurator online, and I don't know, hundreds of millions of, of combinations where you can put together the color of your car, obviously all the trim packaging, Every last detail you can imagine. I own an orange convertible. And I designed it online. I sent it out to friends. I had them tell me what they thought of it. And then I ordered it. 30% of the people who configure a car online are buying that car. Three out of every 10. There is no such conversion rate in the automobile industry that even comes close to that. That is a staggering conversion number. And so as we worked on the brand, our biggest chore and our biggest task was to get people into that configurator. Start playing around with it. Because again, you can put on that artist hat. Whether or not you buy the car or not, you can have fun with it. You can play around with it. You can ask people what they think of it. So mass customization allows brands to address the needs of individuals and not groups of demographics. And I think that's a really cool thing that's happening in technology today. And keep in mind, co-creation is not a trend. Because technology will continue to aid the development of being able to do these kinds of things cost effectively and deliver customized, personalized, co-created products and services. Because these kinds of personalized brand experiences create empowered, inspired, and more loyal consumers. The same way that I'm up here talking about Mini or Nike is the same way you want folks out there talking about your brand. And I do recognize that mass customization and specifically some of these examples may be a little bit of a stretch for this industry. There's long lead times in your world. But you know what? Long lead times means opportunity to have customers for life. So I would give you that advice to think about how can I create and weave mass customization into my experiences. The last truth is about commerce. And the economics of commerce have changed wildly, particularly in the last five years. It's changed how, when, why, and most importantly, where consumers are shopping. Commerce now happens everywhere, anywhere, at any time. It's happening in stores as it always has. It happens on your computer, and most of you in this room know that. E-commerce is a big part of your business. It's happening inside video games, right? There are gamers in the room, you know that you start in certain levels. You can buy more artillery if it's a shooting game. You can buy more outfits if you need to. It's amazing how much commerce is actually taking place within the walls of video games themselves. It's happening inside of applications. Big brands like The Gap are producing these beautiful, integrated, seamless experiences that blend commerce with the brand. More than 47% of people who, have, who own a tablet are already shopping on that tablet. It's happening on your phone. And in the next five years, mobile commerce will account for more than $31 billion. It's roughly at about $3 billion today. So the exponential growth of this particular channel is huge. It's happening in groups, right? We're all familiar with Groupon, social living. It's happening on Facebook. I applaud those of you, and this is a very specific example. Um, someone is selling wine directly through Facebook, and I can't encourage you enough to consider this in your marketing strategies. Facebook, for better or for worse, has become a place that people hang out at. And what's, you know, shopping is social. Why make them leave Facebook if they don't have to? How about just click to see your catalog within the framework of Facebook? How about just click to put something into your shopping cart within the framework of Facebook? You, they never leave. They have an integrated experience. It's happening on street corners with the advent of technologies like Square, which is a merchant service 
services company that's a fairly inexpensive little device. You plug it into the top of your iPhone and it reads credit cards. And you can be up and running just like that. To me, it seems like just an ideal fit for tasting rooms and tours in your business. But what do these new technologies mean for marketers? It means consumers are changing the way they pay for products and services. And it means giving consumers the ability to transact when and how they want to. Google Wallet is gaining traction. I just saw that it was, um, it's become part of Macy's network now. Um, Google is actually intending to replace your wallet, literally. They would like to just completely replace it with this application, with this technology. And in the end, the goal is to facilitate the organic intersection of community, interaction, brand, and ultimately commerce. To create environments in which commerce happens organically as a result of the brand experience. So before I get off the stage, we're at the beginning of a new year, just a few predictions as we look towards the future of marketing. Many of you may be familiar with Brian Eno, who I think summarizes this perfectly. A bit of a renaissance man, a musician, composer. Um, he's known as the principal innovator of ambient music, which is also known as Muzak. We expect that the next big thing will be a bigger version of the last big thing. What we don't expect yet, what is most likely, is that the next big thing won't look important to us at all until it's so important that we can't ignore it. So I'm not here to be able to tell you what's coming next, because I think Brian sums that up really well. But there are, some, there are some things to look forward to, and there are some things that we can count on. Hyperlocal marketing will only get bigger. Groupon, Living Social, there's a number of players in this space right now. And it's a great way for small and medium-sized businesses to promote their offerings. I would encourage you to look into this. And why is hyperlocal marketing only going to get bigger? Because 85% of your searches are local. People are looking in their own communities. People are looking in their own neighborhoods. People want to support local businesses. The other thing I would say is if you were going to invest in only one digital marketing effort, it would be search. People need a wayfinder. Make sure that you're search engine optimization and make sure your paid search are working well. Video marketing has become standard and I think again this applies to your, your business as well. Rather than talking about and telling me about your brand experiences, show them to me. Show them to me through the use of video. It's a much more compelling and interesting and powerful way to communicate. Data marketing continues to become sexy. The reality is, is that there is a footprint that your users are leaving on the websites that they visit. Whether they take action or they don't take action, that's knowledge. Adjust the marketing based on the efficacy of your efforts. Retargeting becomes invaluable in this context. And applications will continue to enhance consumer experiences. This one I found was a Napa Winery uh, application, which allows you to, it provides real-time data on available tours or allows you to book, it, book a tour right there. And finally, reward marketing becomes expected. I grabbed Amazon Prime as an interesting example. I've been an Amazon Prime customer now for about 18 months. And very simply, what it is is you pay $75 a year, and then everything you order directly from Amazon comes in two days. Well, what they did in addition to that was they now made it available a whole library of videos on demand and streaming content. An extra layer of value that doesn't feel like I'm paying for it. I'm sure I am in some way, but it doesn't feel like that because it's in, been integrated very seamlessly. But remember, not all of these kinds of things are right for every brand. Just because Nike and Apple and Starbucks and all these folks are doing them, look inside yourself and have these conversations amongst your team members at, at the companies you work for. And be selective and pay close attention to what really matters for your brand. Couldn't be a marketing presentation without referencing Steve Jobs. And again, I would say don't be afraid to do things differently. Your authenticity and that genuineness will be rewarded. Put less emphasis on innovation and put more emphasis on embracing and tweaking and implementation. A lot of the things you're doing are probably already the right things to be doing, but there's probably subtle changes you can make to them. Additions of technology. And finally, I would say that amidst the rise of all this technology, Good old-fashioned customer service has emerged as a defining characteristic fueling the growth of brands. I think it's ri rather ironic that today I listen to 
advertisements and commercials that tout the fact that a real person is going to pick up the phone when I call them. Nothing replaces great customer service, whether it comes from a small business, a big company, or an individual within that company. We all know what it's like to receive great customer service, so make sure that that is a constant part of your business. And in closing, I'll leave you with this final quote. When marketing exists inside situations, the brand's own story is irrelevant. The experience itself will always be stronger. Thank you. David, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.